Hello, I'm Billy Crump with Clash DVD, and we're at End of the Golf Disc today in Rock Hill, South Carolina, and we're going to go in, we're going to talk to Jonathan Poole about the USDGC past and the future. Well, I'm here with one of my oldest and dearest friends, Jonathan Poole. JP, how are you today, man? Good. Well, you had, uh, you had a big event. You changed it. You called it the performance edition. I, I guess the first thing I want to know is, in your eyes, as the event coordinator and the creator, was the 2011 USDGC a success? Yeah, I think it was a, a huge success on you know on a lot of different levels. Um, I wouldn't say I was the creator of it. You know, I want to you know step back and at least address that. You know, I mean, part of uh, the man makes in the soup. Though. It it takes a lot of people uh, to make this thing happen, and um, you know, I'm just one of them. Um, but you know, it was uh, it was good. Um, you know, it was a little different vibe out there this year. But you know, one thing that I really liked was it was smaller. You know, with 120 or so players as opposed to 190, a uh, little less fanfare. I think there was a more intimate feeling uh, that we hadn't had in a while. Um, I thought that was special. Uh, I think in general, the mood was lighter. You know, it was still competitive, but you know, everybody was really happy. So I mean, it it, it felt good from that standpoint. Um, but you know, I also look beyond the tournament and look at more of the overall event details. So you know, things like. You know, we brought almost 600 kids out from area schools through our Keene, you know, promotion with Keene. And, um, Over at the Edge Village? Yeah, so it's always nice to see all those kids come out and experience disc golf. And, um, you know, to me, that is, that's a big success. Um, you know, also think about uh, the charitable contributions. You know, I mean, we were able to exceed what we had projected for most of the year. Um, you now, know, when you say charitable contributions, you're talking real money, you're talking merchandise, and we're talking real charities? Oh, yeah. Well, I mean, you know, we, we work with... a lot with, of charities involved, right? Well, every day, the players, everybody in the field played for a different cause. So we had uh, Habitat for Humanity one day and uh, Special Olympics and Rolling Thunder, some of the, you know, the organizations we've worked with in, in years prior to now. But definitely a cash contribution to each of those groups. And, um, you know, our, our the tournament's lifetime total has now gone over $200,000. Um, with this year's events, uh, you know the, the contributions from this year's events. So you know, the, pure charity. That's that's a lot. I don't know that a lot of people realize that that much money is being given back from the event. Right. Well, I mean, it's it's important. So there are other ways to measure, you know, measure success beyond just the contest. You know, the competition itself. Well, I mean, a lot of new players that were there. To me, it felt like there was a, a lot of new life. Uh, I mean. What did you take out of the attitude that the new players brought and the excitement that they brought? Well, their energy level was high. You know, I mean, we had, you know, probably at least 80% of the players were first year, you know, first visits to, to Winthrop. And so, you know, our enthusiasm as a team is always fairly high. Um, but when that collides with all of those new faces and, and people who were just, you know, there, they were really excited to be there. As they should be. And, uh, yeah, it, you, you know, they were, they were very gracious to our spotters all week and, um, you know, to all of our staff. I mean, I had, I had several people approach me at various times throughout the week and they were in tears trying to express what it meant to them. And so, you know, that's something that, you know, you get, it's just different kind of good feelings. You know, it's always nice to see the top guys go at it. But this really is disc golf. So, I mean, it, it, this to me got us a little back, you know, closer to our roots. And, um, you know, it felt good. And I think our team probably walked away a bit more refreshed because they really felt appreciated. Well, you know, the scoring was a big issue, the performance-based uh, scoring. Do you see that continuing? Do you see you tweaking that? Did you learn good things, bad things? Give me an idea of Jonathan Poole's feedback on just how the performance scoring went and how you might hope that it gets a little better or smoother in the future. Well, we're going to stick with performance scoring um, as a part of this event in the future, not necessarily exclusively that, uh, that style. Um, I was thrilled to death after day one to see Feldberg right in the mix and, uh, 
you know, and even David Wiggins, you know, he shot great out there to qualify on Monday, and you know, he was right up there at the top as well. So, I thought that the when you look at the numbers, the calculations that sort of drive performance scoring, I thought. We, we did good, you know, I mean, I think we, we walked away with a few things that we want to change to bring the field a little bit closer together. Um, you know, we had, you know, one exception, you know, our champion, uh, John Key, you know, no, certainly no disrespect to him at all. I mean, he played great. I think he, he clearly earned it. He rose the, to the occasion when he had He did. I mean, he, he did what it took to win. I think when you, look at the, when you look at the difference in strokes from him in second place, I mean, had you removed him from the equation, we would have had a, a shootout on Saturday. And that's always something that you hope for as a, as a promoter. But, you know, in John's particular case, he certainly didn't milk the system or do anything that you know that wasn't anything other than completely legitimate it's just I think we need to have um, players need to have more PDGA rounds under their belt um, to help get his you know to get his and others projected scores just right so will you be maybe adjusting and requiring more events uh, I think I want to say he had two or three events just to use John as an example, if I'm going to go out and I want to try and qualify for the performance edition, I've been retired. How many events would I need to compete in to get a true number for you to really base my, my performance score on? Well, we're looking at two key things. One, um, you know, having at least 12 rounds and they need to be, you know, and this is for next year, you know, they, they would, your rounds would need to take place within sort of that calendar year between championships. So it's not just 12 rounds dating back. They can't be old data, which is something that can skew the numbers. Um, so if so you're looking for a current player with current skill levels is, is the ideal goal, I guess, for the championship. All right. And then the other thing that I think will help is we're going to we're going to bring the floor up a little bit in terms of that player rating. You know, the minimum to be eligible for this this year was 850. And after doing some studies on that, we're, we've decided to move it up to 875. Um, I think that will more than the quality of, of you know, the skill level or talent level, what we're going to get is, you know, you're going to move further up into the bracket of people who play tournaments that more regularly. Would have affected uh, maybe five, six percent of the field that was here this year. Something like that. I mean, it, we actually ran the number based on 900 initially, and that would have eliminated about 15 people. You know, so it's. Uh, you know, I guess I, I don't compete like I used to, and so I guess with all these players now, um, I'm trying to better understand how much uh, of a swing 10 or 15 or 20 whatever ratings points actually means at that level. It's different from the top guys than it is to say a, a 900 to 950 rated player. There's more people down there. Well, the performance edition was a success. I'm going to ask you the tough question. You didn't have a payout. How much money did you make? I mean, was this just a money-driven situation? No, you know, I mean, we don't, we've never walked away with, uh, you know, we don't make anything off the championship. You know, I mean, in, in some of the early years, we set it up to where there was an emergency reserve for just expenses that you might, you just, you just don't no, know. Can't, some more yellow. Yeah, you know, you just, you don't know what to expect. So, but, you know, that, that might be, it was never more than five or six thousand dollars, and that any any money that might have been left, and this has been years ago, was always rolled over, and that sort of was our, our you know our beginning financial amount for the for the following year. Um, but you know between between payouts and all the expenses and costs that it takes to to put on the event um, and the charitable contributions. Um, you know, I mean, it's a it's a break even. The tournament is a break even effort. You know, from an Innova standpoint, when you when you add up the hundreds upon hundreds of hours um, that that we pay employees to you know to help run this event, I mean, it's not a it's not a money making deal. That's not why we do it. Well, there's been a lot of talk on the message boards, on your email, even on your cell phone. A lot of a lot of passionate talk. I mean, it's not all good. There's been a lot of criticism. Uh, how does that affect you? I mean, does it hurt? Does it drive you? Do you learn from it? Yeah, all those. <laughs> um, you know, I had to get uh, I had to get used to it 
uh, I think that's good though. I mean, looking back on it, it was, it was tough in the beginning, not so much the criticism. Um, I mean, I think if you're doing something in life, you're, you're probably going to get criticized from somebody, uh, by somebody. It doesn't matter who you are or what you're doing. Um, but people are going to form an opinion and they're entitled to those opinions. Um, you know, I'm fortunate to be in an opportunity to be criticized, you know, to have that opportunity. You know, I'm, I'm grateful that Innova uh, has faith in me to, to you know, to kind of take the lead on some of the tournament things. Um, and I don't mind that, you know, I mean, the, the criticism is, uh, the criticism has been good. You know, it's, it's forced me to look at their opinions and where they're really coming from and a lot of those a lot of those criticisms I completely understood some of them I even agreed with um, but you know we're trying to do the best thing for the tournament we're trying to do the best thing for disc golf we're trying to do the best thing for our company we're trying to do the best thing for the PDGA um, there are a lot of there are a lot of different angles and not everyone has the perspective on all those angles and so you know I sleep fine at night I know what we're doing and uh, I think we're we're getting it done well I think the one thing that everybody right now uh, wants to know is what are you going to do next year what is the format are you bringing the old USDGC back will the performance edition now take over are you going to meld them together what's going to happen in 2012 with the USDGC well, it'll be called simply the United States Disc Golf Championship. Um, you know, that's, uh, there's no addition. You know, it is the USDGC. Um, we'll be back at Winthrop October 3, 4, 5, and 6. Uh, the plan right now is to split the field in half. You know, again, I talked about a little bit of a you know, smaller field. We were down. Um, we probably could have had a few more groups out there than what we did and still had plenty of daylight and, you know, still been very manageable. You know, so, so you're talking split the field in half. You're talking two flights of players? Well, we want to have 144 players. That's the projected field size split right down the middle. You know, and what we're looking to do is have 72 in an open flight, which is more of the traditional playing for the ring, you know, playing, playing for the for title. That. And there's, there will be a prize purse available. But the other 72 players um, will qualify and compete using performance scoring the way that we did this year. And, you know, I, I like that. You know, I like both of these. You know, I didn't want to see uh, the traditional USDGC go every other year. Um, and honestly, I don't want to see this one go every other year either. You know, you need to have, you need to keep momentum. And with something new, if we were to take this to every other year, I don't know that it would, we wouldn't, it'd be a long time before we'd get a chance to apply the lessons that we just learned. Well, and you know, we talked about the vibe. Uh, I have been to all the USDGCs. One of the difference in the vibes this year for the Performance Edition players was only getting to see a handful of those great players that they always wanted to meet. That will completely change next year as you'll have those 72 players every time they turn around seeing the Stevie Ricos and the Ken Climos of the world. Do you think that will just enhance the vibe next year? I hope so. Um, you know, I think it'll be great to bring uh, more of a diverse group together. You know, one or the other, we talked about the successes, um, you know, the clinics. You know, the guys that, that came and did clinics each night, they were fantastic. Um, Huge and, crowds, and they stayed, I think Barry stayed an extra hour and a half, but the people really were sponges and they wanted the knowledge. Yeah, and even, uh, you know, there were some accomplished players there, uh, and even members of our staff who took all that in. You know, I mean, we, there was something to be learned by players of all skill levels every night, hands down. And so I'd like to do more of that next year. Uh, I'd like to see more clinics, just little breakout sessions that are going on throughout the, throughout the week. Um, and you know, I guess in terms of the 72 players, I mean, I like that that's going to make what was a pretty exclusive event even more. You know, I mean, there will be no exemptions to get into that open flight. You know, I mean, you will, the only, the only people right now who are eligible to play in the open flight next year are our top 20 from 2010. So you're telling me that a uh, former world champion is no longer uh, pre-qualified, uh, that even a five-time U.S. champion, Ken Climo, is not pre-qualified. It is all based on that top 20. What's a Harold Duvall or a Dave Dunapace, who is a fixture at this event, what are they going to do? 
Well, you know, you'd still need to qualify. Um, you know, those guys would have an opportunity. Everybody's got an opportunity to qualify for either one, but you got to earn it. Um, there are no exemptions. There are no free passes. I mean, with a field, and that's that's tough. That's going to be one of those things that I think will have have the haters stirred up a little bit. Um, is wondering why we wouldn't give exemptions to some of those former champions or your top money or points or whatever. Um, you know, to win at the USGGC, you got to get out on a big stage and you got to get the job done. And we believe with only 72 spots already cut down to 52 when you take out the 20 who are already in, um, that to get in, you should have to go out on a big stage and prove that you can get it done when the time is right. So to, to win a world title, even five years ago, as quickly as the game has evolved, it doesn't mean you're one of the best players right now. You know, now many of them are. Um, and so from a short-term standpoint, it may not be, uh, it may not make that big of an impact, but in five, 10, 15 years down the road, with only 72 players, you should have to prove, you know, it's like making the PGA Tour, you gotta earn it and you gotta prove that you can, Every you gotta earn your keep. Yeah, and so, you know, just to make it into that field will be quite an accomplishment, but the reward will be there. You know, I mean, we take 72 players. They play Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. Uh, we plan to cut to the top 36 on Saturday. Wow, There's only, only 36 players, half the field, but half the field gets paid. You know, so, so if you make the cut uh, at the 2012 USDGC in the open flight, you're going to be getting paid. Correct. In the performance right now, the plan is to let those guys play. Uh, I shouldn't say guys, you know, those men and women. Let them play all four rounds. And it'll probably flip-flop a little bit. You know, you'll, your open flight competitors will play amongst themselves. And the per performance flight will play amongst themselves after day one. Everybody will play together in typical tournament fashion on Wednesday. But then for Thursday, Friday, Saturday, that's when you'll see the flights. So if you shoot the best actual score, you're going to tee off last. You know, and so those, you know, those performance guys will probably go off first in the morning and then the open flight will go off in the afternoon. Um, I really like the idea of on Friday letting the open flight go first so that the performance guys aren't teeing off first thing every day. Um, but then on Saturday go back to performance or your first tee times of the day and there might be a little bit of a break and then the open flight begins to tee off and closes out the show. Well, and everything we're talking about, this is just sort of, I'll say, on the chalkboard. I mean, none of this stuff is really in stone as far as what you just mentioned. But these are ideas to actually enhance not only the open flight division, but the performance flight division, it sounds like, and allow everybody to actually enjoy different parts of the USDGC. Now, you know, throwing distance has been a big situation since you brought it in I personally like throwing distance is that going to remain are the rules going to remain the same for both flights uh, will you will you change the, the rules from a performance flight versus an open flight how is that going to work at this point you know throwing distance I think has served us well it's 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 very different um, you know and I was able to play two rounds out there I actually got to play my first two rounds on that course you know carefully carted rounds using throw and distance and painful isn't it it can be it's painful in spots you know I, I put up a, an 86 and a 90 and my 90 felt better you know I felt like I played better but you have those spots where you know if you don't get it in bounds you know the numbers the numbers add up and you know after after some good conversations with players, Phil Arthur was one of them, um, I knew I needed to be able to better relate to what they were feeling specifically with throw and distance. And so, um, you know, I walked away with that. And, you know, for, for 2012, the plan is to eliminate throw and distance wall to wall, meaning every hole being played is that. But you're still um, going to incorporate it. Well, there will be certain holes where we will use that format. I mean, like 3 and 17, for example. I mean, 17, if you don't put it on the green, then you should re-throw. That's just the way that hole ought to be played, in my opinion. Um, you know, but it's, it's as much for... Um, time you know we had some five plus hour rounds out there and I don't know of anyone who wants to grind for five or six hours 
for four consecutive days. You know, I mean, I, I feel like the, the challenge here should be the greatest, or at least among the greatest. Um, but it should also be, uh, it should also be enjoyable and, and memorable and, um, and not just grueling. And so I do, I do get the fact that it can be, you know, we've been using the words, there's, there's penal and then there's brutal. And Winthrop Gold is pretty tough as it is. When you put them, you know, when you put throwing distance on every hole, boy, I mean, it's just a, it's a test that many aren't prepared to take. Well, so we're still going to have it. Um, we know of two holes from what you're saying that it will remain. And it sounds like there may be a couple more holes on the course where the throwing distance will be there. Will there be any other new rules? Um, and how do you expect these players to prepare for the new rules and for the adaptations they're going to be dealing with? Well, that's a good point. Um, you know, I guess I want to answer the second part first. You know, I mean, this is a, a very difficult test. I mean, it's a, it's a complicated course. It's a long course. There's a lot of different rules that, that can change from, from hole to hole. Um, and one of the things where we failed, I felt, this year um, is not getting our caddy book out to players earlier. You can't show up to take a test unless you've had an opportunity to study. And, um, you know, years ago we chose to combine our caddy book and our program. Which is convenient. It's good. There's definitely some advantages to that. You know, however, you can't always get all the program de details completed way in advance like you can on some of the course things. And so I don't know that we'll necessarily print to booklets, but we do have every intention of having at least a digital version. I mean, if we put a PDF for example, of the caddy book out online earlier than whether you're on a computer or you're using your phone or whatever, you're able to go in and look and see, okay, well, here, here are the rules that will apply for this particular hole. You've got the actual work you need to do your studying and to be prepared when you do show up on the grounds. Yeah, and as far as any new rules, you know, I mean, it's still early on that. You know, we're, we're talking about, uh, you know, potential rules variants on on the traditional OB, you know, because on most holes, I would say fewer than a third of the holes will will use true throw and distance like we've been using. Um, but then what do you do on the shots that go out of bounds? And so we're, we're looking at something that's much closer to traditional OB rules, but still might better serve that particular course. And that's because been submitted and sort of being looked over. So really hard to, um, hard well, to discuss whether or not it's an option at this point. Yeah, I mean, it's going gonna, it's gonna to take a while. I mean, we're looking at the wording of the variants that we would like to request. And, and you know, that hasn't been submitted to the PDGA just yet and certainly they will need to they'll need to sign off on it but from what I've seen um, I don't know why they why they wouldn't you know I mean we're, we're learning from every little thing we do we're all learning the PDGA and the USGGC well I know one thing everybody is excited to hear you say that the original style of the USGGC will be back uh, half the players out there are jumping up and down how are they going to qualify? I mean, what is the qualifying procedure? Because if there's only 52 spots that you're telling me right now, I need to know, am I going to give myself more than one opportunity to qualify? I mean, have you even had a chance to hash all that out? Can you give me an idea of what a player is going to have to do to get into the USDGC in 2012? Well, there will be regional qualifiers. You know, that's an important part, as we discussed earlier. You've got to go out during that year and prove that you can get it done. So to qualify for the open flight, you'll need to shoot some of the best scores at some of the biggest events. Raw score, you know, so you're going to have to be atop the leaderboard to earn your way into the championship in so 2012. We what events those are yet, but they will be PDGA events. Certainly, you know, this is a PDGA major. You know, I mean, we work closely um, and and take a lot of a lot of pride in our relationship and and our role in helping grow disc golf in general. That's something that that you know we go hand in hand with the PDGA. So there'll absolutely be PDGA sanctioned events until their calendar takes shape. Um, we're not going to know which ones. 
Um, you know, same thing for the performance flight. Yeah, except for you know, qualifying will be based on performance scoring. So, like it was this year, you know, you might go to the Kansas City wide open. You'll play the way that the tournament would normally be played after the event. Um, most likely, we will take a look at all those results. We'll look at all the divisions who played the same t same courses, same holes, same tees, um, and we'll run those numbers based on the performance calculations and we'll shuffle the leaderboard based on your over under you know your projected score so um, you know that that worked well you know we've the performance scoring is not new I mean I've said that many times you know we were bringing that along as side action at the USGGC for years and so we didn't just this didn't just pop out of nowhere. I mean, we had already made a lot of refinements, and I think when you look at the leaderboard, obviously with a few exceptions, people were, were pretty close. Um, Could have been anybody from the top three cards, with the exception of John that day, really having a chance to win last year. Well, the really interesting thing was, I mean, there were very few people, even with a projected score, there was a lot of red. Um, you know, there were, some, there were some big numbers out there, so I think that speaks to just how challenging uh, Winthrop Gold is, regardless of the of the rules format you're using, it's tough. And so most everybody was over par, and there were a bunch who were way over par, over their projected. Right. Not 68. I mean, you might be 86, and you were 25 over that. Um, so there were some there were some big numbers out there, and um, you know we were able to learn from that as well. Well, you know, Mondays are always a big day. Um, you know, used to be considered an off day, but the last chance qualifying has taken on an aura of its own, and you see in years past a lot of the top players out there caddying and rooting on some of their buddies. How's that going to work this year? Are we going to have a, a last chance qualifying for the projected as well as the open flights? I believe so. Um, my only hesit hesitancy there is whether we will do it for both. I mean, I think we definitely want to have Monday qualifying for the open flight. You know, that is one of Monday is one of the most exciting days. And that's a tradition of the week. You know, I mean, I look forward to Monday. I mean, you feel something out there on Monday. It's it it's like Saturday already. You know, the tension's in the air. Except, you know, it's you know when you're when you're right there for that fifth guy who makes it in, and for the sixth person who doesn't. Um, you know, I mean, there's it's intense. You know, and you don't feel anything like that until you get to late in the afternoon on Saturday, if you're lucky. You know, so we look forward to Monday and and want to have that. Um, until though we know which events are going to be qualifiers and how that will fit in, you know, I, I hate to put that in concrete, but most everything else we've discussed is the concrete is drying. Well, uh, you know, we certainly appreciate your time. I guess the, the one question we have left is what's the future of the USDGC? Do you see us being able to enjoy the open flight and the performance flight each year from this point on? Yeah, I mean that's that's where we are right now. You know, I, I it's hard to say what you know what the future will hold because we will do what we believe is best based on the information we have at that time. Um, we're pleased with how things went this year. It was a success, and um, you know, I I think what we have achieved, and you know, again, this is. This is worth touching on. This will be a good closer. You know, the original decision on all of this was to go every other year on the USDGC. You know, that was mainly because we knew we had to find a tournament model that we could sustain for years to come. Um, the second decision, which was more than a month later, was to try something different, and that was something using performance scoring. And then it was several months later, it was actually after the USGGC last year, so you're talking about a span from August to late October when we decided to call that something new, the United States Disc Golf Championship Performance Edition. Most people, in my opinion, lose sight of the timeline of those decisions and why each one was made. Um, but now, we have a model that financially and logistically here, we can take 
on into the future. You know, I don't want to just wonder how we're going to make it through another one. I want to see how we can run them <laughs> to infinity. You know, I mean, it should be a stable, just like a business, it should be stable. You should be able to project how you're going to get it done. And as the championship grew, the fundraising model couldn't keep up. It was keeping up, but it was treading water. So what we've been able to do is to make some changes that will enable us to continue to drive the ship. The partner program is healthy. It supports a lot of what we do financially with this event. This is their event, as it is the players. Um, you know, I think by having a bit of a smaller field, it's going to be more manageable for us. Um, I think by, by showcasing the very best of the best, um, it's going to be one heck of a show when it comes to who's going to take the ring and the title you know, of United States champion. But we're also going to bring in a whole other wave of people who will be thrilled to be there. They'll add to the atmosphere. They'll have a, an incredible opportunity to play um, a great championship. And I think if the numbers work out right, what you're going to see that field become in years, to, you know, in years down the road is that sort of up and coming, that next level of pros who dream of making it into the USGDC. So they'll still get a taste, but you're going to have to be on top of your game to compete for the ring. Well, the top 72 players current will be eligible next year. Uh, that's still being worked out. Have you got a number? Because I know that's the next question a lot of these guys are going to ask. Are you prepared to tell them what they're going to be playing for? Is there a purse number uh, out there? I mean, are we looking at 15,000, 20,000? Do we even have that number yet? At least 40. You know, at least 40,000 split. Uh, you know, amongst amongst 36? amongst 36 players. I mean, I've already gone through a variety of different payout scenarios there. Um, you know, it. it, it We'll just have to see, you know, I mean, obviously the fundraising piece has to continue to go at the rate that it's going. And, and some of it's a little bit new, you know, we're doing the Champion Rock Plus through our wholesale distribution. It's still a fundraising disc, more like the end of a CFR program. Um, you know, so hopefully the sales of those will remain steady because that money comes back to the championship. If the guys uh, in the open flight feel like they have that big tournament and that possible big check at the end of the year that they can still get excited about and prepare for. Yeah, I mean, it'll be it'll be exciting. You know, I mean, you'll see a flatter payout. You know, we have, you know, traditionally had a fairly flat payout, but when you're, you're talking about paying half the field, um, I'm not sure. Half the field of what was originally. Yeah, so, you know, I mean, if you make it into the top 36, it needs to be, you know, it needs to be more than just covering your, covering your cost. And so, um, you know, we're shuffling around those numbers and trying to see, you know, what, what l makes sense financially. And, um, you know, and we listen to the players. You know, I mean, this, I've, I've said this a lot of times, I mean, this is the players' championship they need to they should feel a sense of ownership i think that's why there was such backlash when we went to every other year when we made that announcement because they did feel that they felt like we were messing with something that that they really have a strong personal and emotional they attachment you know. to and that's great i mean i would hate to have you know made a decision like that and gotten no reaction at all um, but the fact that it was ferocious at times was a good sign and so Point is, um, they are involved. You know, I mean, I have been talking to players on both sides of the coin, both both performance competitors who were here this year, and I've also been talking to some of the best, you know, the best players out there because I want their feedback, not just on format and rules, but also payout to a certain extent. I mean, I need to understand. Even I'm not traveling and living the professional lifestyle, but I'm personally doing everything I can to to really understand and connect with them. That's very important because the payout needs to make sense within the context of where professional disc golf is today. And that's always, for me, been what the USGGC has been about. Not just that, but that's the mentality behind the, the payout aspect of it. Well, the payout will be back. The original USDGC will be back and the performance edition. I think it's going to be an improved USDGC in 2012. It's going to be possibly the best one that we've ever put on. Jonathan Poole, we thank you for your time and your honesty, and uh, we look forward to talking to you again. Good deal. Thank you. 
Well, that's Jonathan Poole, the old US DGC. It's back with the cash. The new US DGC, the Performance Edition, they'll both be melded together. I think it's gonna be a great thing. Stay tuned as we keep you informed of what's going on in disc golf.